Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown for the week of January 11th, yes, 11th, 2017. My name is Trey, this is the Full Spectrum, I'm still sick, and let's get started. So if we start off this week with My Hero Academia 163, Smoldering Flames, which gives us the popularity poll results, and Bakugo took first. So, in the popularity polls for series, <clears throat> it's very rare that your main character isn't the first one. Uh, it happens sometimes with things like uh, Bleach. It would pop up where, when Byakuya was a big character in the Bleach, uh, he got number one once. Uh, Renji got pretty high up there, but I don't think he ever passed Ichigo. But it's happened here, uh, where Bakugo took over. Now I expect the next popularity poll will be completely different, with because Bakugo wasn't a part of this last arc. Where I expect uh, Mirio will be pretty high up there, and Sun Eater will be pretty high up there, and Night Eye will be pretty high up there, uh, and Deku will probably take first slot back again. But hey, this is a good poll. I, I really appreciate it. And seeing Karishima get all the way up to number three, like that's great. Yeah, um, the whole class was waiting for them. <clears throat> The whole class was waiting for them, and I'm a sucker for stuff like that. And Ida, you know, tries to step in and say, whoa, they need time to rest. And then as soon as Deku's like, no, I'm okay now. Uh, he's like, I was so worried. Uh, I love these characters so much, and their interactions with each other. Uh, they they talk to Urakura a little bit, and, you know, she talks about how she's decided she wants to save people. She knows what it feels like now to hold somebody that is close to death in her arms. And she wants to stop that from happening again. She wants to be able to save them before that happens. And we get to see a little flashback of her talking with Aizawa about, you know, how she feels. And it's cool to see her arc is still continuing where she started to try and make money to, to help her family. And is now becoming more and more heroic as time passes. We also get to see Mina check in on Karishima. And that was really cool. And then uh, after that, you know, Todoroki and Bakugo go to bed because they're, they're class time it's next morning, the provisional license training. And they got to be there on time. They're still late. <clears throat> and All Might says being late's a big no-no. Get on the bus. Um, of course, Endeavor's there. Whether it's out of a desire to repair relations with his son, which I don't think it is, or if it's just that he wants to keep being an instigator to try and push Shoto forward, who knows? Maybe he actually wants to make up for what he's done before, but I doubt it. It's Endeavor, after all. Uh, we also get to see the real Kamie, and, you know, she gives Todoroki her number. And then, of course, the rest of the Shiketsu team is there, too. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how that all turns out. This was a really solid chapter. I liked it quite a bit. Quite a bit. Next up, we have One Piece 888 Lion, uh, where Luffy made it back to Katakuri somehow. Um, I guess he just used Brulee to immediately duck back into a mirror. And, you know, talks about how he came back to fight. At this point, I don't really know what the point of him leaving was. Other than just to be like, nah, and Luffy got a chance to rest. Well, he didn't really, because he was running with Brulee on his back and Big Mom was chasing him. But hey, he's back to fight Katakuri now, so I guess that's all fine. Uh, the homies are acting up. And this is really interesting to me. Because we also see that Big Mom is getting thinner. Not by much, but she's, she is getting thinner. And she's weakening. And I'm wondering if that's how this arc is going to wrap. Is that the longer she doesn't get to eat when she's in this state of needing to eat, the longer she doesn't get to eat what she wants to eat, that wedding cake that she wants so badly, the weaker she gets until eventually she does make a deal to eat the cake that Sanji made with putting in chiffon so that they can leave. Or she's going to get so weak that maybe somebody will take her out. I doubt it highly, but hey, you never know. I still think Big Mom's going to be a threat for a while, just a threat off in the distance, because we're getting close to time to leave for the Wano arc. This arc has, has made its, its length, and I think it's a fine arc so far, but I do see people starting to complain about how long it's going, and uh, moving into Wano soon wouldn't be a bad idea. So I think we've probably got another eight or nine chapters, for sure, in Whole Cake, at least, in my opinion, uh, and we could have maybe 20 more chapters before we're done. But I think eight or nine would probably wrap it there. Uh, and part of that wrapping is that Carrot now has her transformation. So she has now fulfilled her character arc of being around and being an interesting character that's different from most other characters to having interesting powers to having a tragic loss in her family or people that she cared about uh, to now having her abilities that make her able to be on par with the crew. 
For her, that's using the power of lightning uh, while looking at the full moon to go Sulong, a moon lion form, uh, to flash step, to uh, push off from the water without touching it. Uh, not that she has a devil fruit, so she could have touched the water if she wanted to. And I'm curious what would have happened with her electric powers if she had. Would they have canceled, or would she have fried the stuff right around her, kind of like we saw with Oven? Um, past that, the ability to just jump around and cause a bunch of damage is really good and could be really interesting in one-on-one fights. But I think she'd be an interesting combatant on par with... Not on par with, I suppose, but of the same style of fighting that we see with Zoro and Sanji, where it's fast movements and powerful attacks. I don't think she's that strong. I mean, she rips the uh, the helm off of the ship that we see, but I don't think she's physically that strong, like Sanji and Zoro are, but I think she is that type of fighter. Either way, uh, Chopper was completely shocked. I uh, couldn't believe it. And I'm going to be honest with you, I thought Carrot looked really cool in her form there. I'm not a huge fan of, you know, oh, it's the transformation, and now the character is way stronger than they were before, but the, at least this transformation has been foreshadowed, because Inuarashi talked about it before, and how if it had been a different day, things would have gone differently, because the minks could fight differently, and knowing that all the minks can do this if they have training to control it is really cool in my opinion. I think it's nifty that their entire race has this this racial trait that lets them be able to grow stronger by looking at the full moon. And of course, if she does become a straw hat, there'll be some kind of update to this power, I'm sure, where she'll be able to use it more often. Maybe Frankie will make her an artificial moon, or Frankie or Usopp one. But either way, really cool. Really fun chapter. I liked it quite a bit. We never learned 43. Sometimes a genius travels down memory lane with X. You thought it was going to be another Takamoto chapter, didn't you? But it's not. It's a Uiga chapter. I called it. So, this chapter is supposed to be about Takamoto and how she first developed her crush for Uiga and and everything there as they go back to the junior high. But what it's actually about is Uiga talking about how he has handled things. We find out that, yes, his dad is dead. That his dad died the day before he went into junior high. And that he seemed so focused because he decided he had to take care of the family. He was the oldest son. And he had to get good grades. And he had to study so that he could take care of his family. And we see him talk about how, no matter how hard he tried, nothing was working. And he felt like he was just going to have to give up. And nothing was going to be worth it anymore. But seeing that Takamoto was still trying so hard on the swim team gave him the courage to keep trying. And so he thanks her for it. You know, he tells her how much he appreciated it. And we also get to see here that her feelings for Yuiga are not just, they're not just a crush. It's not just a basic attraction. It's not a selfish desire. Because if it was, she would have taken this opportunity while, you know, he was remorseful and looked like he needed to feel better to try and confess. But instead, she apologizes and tells him that she's sorry that she brought up those terrible memories for him. And, you know, he immediately is like, no, I gotta change the subject. Let's talk about your crush. Because she's already told him that it wasn't him. Even though the other girls have told him it was him, she's told him it wasn't. He's believing her, and is like, well, let's, have you confessed yet? Have you confessed? She says, no. He says, well, practice on me then. Because he's desperately trying to get it off the topic of his dead father. And she does. And you see it affects him. And then when he tells her she needs to try it again without his name, because she used his name, uh, she pushes him into the pool. <laughs> and this leads to a really interesting moment where she basically tells him, hey, didn't you say you were going to start calling me by my first name? Because he had to for the sake of this confession. And he does. And then she immediately realizes how much that, the confession, and being, pushing him into the pool is going to complicate things. Because now he's going to be calling her by her first name, and not the other girls, which is going to make them suspicious. And, I, you know, I feel like without too much longer, he'll be calling all of them by their first names. But, we'll see how it goes. This was a really good chapter, and I really appreciated getting a look into Yuiga's backstory, and his drive as a character. It's clear that he took that courage and converted it into willpower and drive, 
to be able to keep studying the way that he does. But solid chapter. Really good. You eat a chapter. It needs to happen. Now the cats are fighting. Not the cats are done fighting. The Promised Neverland 67, The Forbidden Game Part 2. Theo is a champ, and unfortunately he's going to be a dead champ, because Luvis has him in his sights. Uh, Theo telling them to go, because he knows that he should have believed them before. That's amazing. That's great. I love that. Emma is angry. Emma is clever. Emma knows exactly what she's doing. She's hunting footprints. She's getting ready to save as many people as she can keeping herself close to the demons, making herself a target by telling the people to tell others, to tell the demons that she's from Gracefield. Emma is Emma in this chapter, and that's great. We don't see her hesitate. We don't see her falter. We see her 100% on task at all times. And that's great. I love that. Emma is uh, wonderful as a character, and this was just another really good, solid chapter of Emma being herself. Um, This mysterious benefactor that she has that also wants her to survive, Probably just wants to have more people that know what they're doing when it comes time for these hunts. Uh, or maybe they're planning on trying to kill one of the demons and, and reduce the number of these rich demons that are coming to hunt them. Luvis looks amazing in this chapter. I am loving him as a villain so much. It's great. And then, of course, at some point we'll have Ray and Nameless Man show up, and that'll be great. Maybe we'll get his name when that happens. But regardless, it's a really fun chapter. I liked it quite a bit. Next up, we have Black Clover 137. Mario Leona versus Raya the Disloyal. Uh, the Living Sharingan is not down. He is actually still doing quite well, although he's probably down at the end of this chapter. And he's getting to show off some of those things I was talking about last week that I wanted to see. The crazy different spells of different attributes of different types. Boom, 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 boom. Just switching between them on the fly. That's what somebody who actually had that power in that world would do as compared to just using one attack like he did last time. And we see him... He tries all these different things, and none of them work on Mary Leona. And we get a little bit of backstory about her from, from Zora. About how she lives out in the wilds, and her mana skin is untouchable, and how she's, you know, made herself so familiar to mana that it's like a, a, a second skin to her already, just the mana of the natural mana of the world. That she eats beasts, and she spends over 300 days a year out in the woods, and in the wastes, and why wouldn't everybody live like that with how powerful it made her? Like, I get that the royals wouldn't, because the royals, I mean, she's a royal too, but she's different. But, why wouldn't, like, Magna do that, if it made people that strong, you know? It just seems a little weird to me that we're 137 chapters in, and we're finding out that there's this way to get super powerful. And obviously, you have to have the willpower to do it. It's not just a thing of, like, oh, I'm living in the wild now, I'm super strong. It's, you have to have the willpower to be able to survive like that, and she clearly does, that's why she's so strong. It just seems weird to me that we haven't had more characters doing that. Like, for instance, when she took everybody to the hot springs on the top of the volcano, everybody seems surprised that they were going to have to climb this volcano. Like, but don't you get stronger by being around high sources of mana? Why aren't you guys climbing volcanoes all the time? Like, come on, guys! It almost feels like this world is full of mages that don't really care if they get stronger or not. They're just powerful already. And it technically is, because the world is full of royal mages. And there are very few peasant mages. And most of the royals are obviously used to being royals, so they wouldn't do things like climbing volcanoes. So I guess it does make sense. It's just a little weird to me uh, that now that we have a lot of the peasants, they're not doing stuff like this. You have uh, the living Sharingan, Raya, Try to take down Mario Leona by using... I'm going to get her name at some point. By using a copy of Asta's sword. And, you know, immediately Asta and Zora are shocked. And it's like, well, yeah, she won't hit it. Because if it is anti-magic, it'll break her fist. She hits it with no no reserve. Because she doesn't care. And then she's like, oh, it wasn't anti-magic. Huh. And then just continues to beat down on him. And I like Mario Leona a lot. I'm just afraid that... Because of how powerful she is, she's going to be removed from the story somehow. Either a terrible injury or a death to keep her from being too OP. Because we've already seen a lot of OP characters in the series. Yami, for instance, is very powerful. The difference is that Yami's abilities are one specific type, you know? Uh, Yami's abilities are darkness. That's it. That's what they do. 
he's got a lot of other cool stuff he can do, but that's that's what his abilities are. Then you have Mary Leona, who's not able, not only able to burn through fire with her fire, but also water with her fire. It's like, okay, yeah, mm. something's gonna happen to her. She's gonna die or take an injury or something, so that she's not so powerful because she's too OP now. But next up, we have Doctor Stone thirty nine, and the winner is Sinku. So I did not expect this. This is really cool, uh, Genro. His uh, his greed overcomes his friendship power. His friendship level, if we want to talk about it that way. He basically, he gets too greedy. And he realizes that if he beats Sinku, and then beats Chrome, he can be uh, chief. And so he tries, and Sinku takes him out. Uh, after the entire village decides they don't want him to win. And then <laughs> Chrome, having thrown Sinku Suika's helmet so that he can take him out, passes out. And Sinku wins. And you see Ruri's confusion, and you see Sinku, the horror in Sinku's eyes, and you see confusion, just raw confusion on Kohaku's face, and the entire tribe is either shouting in joy, or looking very confused, as Sinku's declared chief. Sinku's chief now, so I guess he gets to marry Ruri. Chrome will be happy that Ruri's okay, at least, but Ruri clearly wanted to marry Chrome, so I don't know if, if Senku's first act as chief will be to change that rule or to appoint a second that will marry her instead. Uh, I don't know how that's going to go. But remember that Kohaku had also considered that Senku might be the type of guy that she could finally settle down with uh, when in the first couple chapters after she met Senku. So I'm sure there'll be some hurt feelings there if Senku does go through with it. I mean, Kohaku looked pretty upset at the end of this chapter. But all told, this was a really fun chapter. Seeing Genro uh, give in to his greed was pretty cool. Uh, he still obviously will be the team's friend and everything, but his sleaziness outweighed his kindness. What can you do? Uh, next up, we have Robot Laser Beam 123, last day of the Dyson Open Part 3. So, Robo has finally figured out what's wrong. And it's that he wanted Dorian to be able to win, too. Just like we talked about a couple weeks ago that I thought that might be the problem because he's only gone up against challengers that he couldn't be friends with, just rivals with. Dorian is his friend, and he doesn't want Dorian to lose any more than he wants himself to lose. That's been thrown off his game. Dorian reveals that that's a little upsetting to him because he wanted to face Robo at his, you know, true power, and Robo tells him to hit him and then changes his mind and says, why don't you slap me instead? Uh, gets knocked into a bush, comes out of it, and they're both ready to play again. Dorian gets a crazy backspin on his shot. And then Robo declares a hole-in-one. He's gonna do it. And so this was a very... It was a short chapter, but it was a very important chapter. Because now we have... Robo's figured out that he can be friends with people and still fight against them. He just has to be able to separate those two things in his mind. To be able to say it's okay. To take the friendship and the desire to win and combine those two to, hey... I'm going to do my best because we're friends. Not, I'm going to hold back because we're friends. So, you know, every sports manga has to have that moment at some point. And uh, this was handled pretty good, I think. I liked it. Next up, we have Food Wars 243, First Year Kid. The Secret to Success, Mimasaka's Sacrificial Trace. I love everything about Mimasaka's Trace and the way that it's used to help other characters. The fact that his trace comes back here to back up Yukihira, to back up Aldini, to back up Megami, is great. I love it so much. And to have this whole chapter be presented in the form of a duel between Saito and Soma, where every time Soma draws a blade, it gets cut in half. I'm just going to read you my notes that I took. The tracing taught Soma how to face Saito, what he needed to win. He built his victory upon the strength of his teammates. No matter how many blades Saito cut through, Soma always had another. A field of blades earned through victories and defeats, handed over by those he faced. Saito admits his defeat. I never take notes like that. I always just take a little bit of notes here and there about what happened throughout the chapter so I can remember to talk about it just in case it didn't strike a chord with me. The fact that 
Soma's victory is built on every challenge he's faced before. I loved it so much that I immediately just started writing, and it was like... Because I absolutely adore that. That is one of my favorite things to happen. Because whether we realize it or not, everything about any victories we get in life are built on the failures and victories we've had before. And it's almost never brought up. For instance, you know, we look at all the big fights in One Piece. Very rarely does somebody mention, well, yeah, I only got this power because I did this, 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 and this. I only got this good because this this happened, and this happened, and this happened. But here's, someone calls it out. And he probably won't call it out ever again. This will probably be the only time it gets called out in the entire manga. But it's great. And it was done in such a cool way, where as the swords are breaking, he's picking up more swords from the field that are based on different people that he knows. You have the EP, you have the Zambato, you have the basic katana, you have the pole arm. They're, they're all based off the different people that he's fought before that have made him stronger, that have sharpened the edge of his blade so that he can take on Saito and win. And it's just this really solid moment when Saito admits defeat. Uh, there's also a really fun gag in the middle of there where he pulls out a rifle and Saito's like, you're not even using a sword anymore. Uh, I loved this chapter. It was great. It was absolutely great. Next up, we have One Punch Man 78, Surrounded. Uh, Genos gets an upgrade. News spreads about the monster organization or association, and everybody's starting to panic a little bit. Uh, Metal Knight refuses to help, as could have been expected. <laughs> the monsters all heed the call and start to head towards City Z, only to get killed by Saitama, who was just passing through. <laughs> <coughs> Tario meets the hero hunter again, Garo, uh, after being sent in there by a group of bullies that he's friends with, and a whole group of heroes, including Stinger and Death Gatling, Smile Man, they're all there to take down Garo, and they're just prepared to shoot as soon as the door opens, and of course we, the viewer, knows there's a child in there, but uh, as the door goes to open... Garo recognizes that people are surrounding him and asks Tario instead to give him his hero guide. Uh, most likely with the intention of figuring out who's out there based on their presences and making a strategy. But, you know, this is also One Punch Man, so who knows? He could even be planning on trying to disguise himself as one of the heroes and say that Garo escaped. I mean, there's, there's just no way to know, knowing One Punch Man. But this was a really fun chapter. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Then we get some bonus manga. We get to see uh, a bonus Boruto, a bonus Black Clover, a bonus uh, Laser Beam, and a bonus uh, We Never Learn. And we get to see Reindeer Shino on the, the cards, Santa Jiraiya, Santa Kakashi, and Santa Hinata. And of course, Boruto looks a little shocked to see his mom and how into the pose she got. My question is, were they, did they did they pose these? For the people who were alive, and for Jiraiya who's dead, they just drew him as Santa? Or did they just draw them based on what they thought the characters would... How the people in that world would feel being drawn like that? Because one of either two things happened. Either they all posed for them, and Hinata loved it, and they just had to draw Jiraiya, and that artist got super sad. Or... <laughs> nobody posed for them, and they were all drawn... And somebody got super into drawing Hinata into the pose. I love both takes. I love both of them so much. The first is tragic. The second is amazing. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that was a thing. Then you have Robo's dad trying to make him fried bread like he'd had with his friends. And he makes him a fried bread vegetable sandwich. And uh, Robo wasn't quite happy with that. We have Fuego Leon refusing to throw Leo down a gorge as Mario Leona demands that he do so, because lions throw their young down cliffs <laughs> to make them stronger, supposedly, to her. Uh, and then we have the We Never Learned Kotatsu scene, where Ogata and Takamoto are touching Furuhashi's feet under the table, but they're super happy because they think it's Yuiga, so she just decides not to say anything. This is a lot of fun, these little special bonuses. I wish they'd do them more often. These were obviously Christmas-themed, for the most part. Uh, you know... Fuego Leon wasn't wearing a Santa hat or anything. But um, I liked it quite a bit, seeing these. 
So, next up we have our lightning round. My Hero Academia 163, Smoldering Flames. Really good chapter. Absolutely loved everything to do with the popularity poll, of course. But then seeing the class all waiting for him there, I'm a huge sucker for that, so I absolutely loved it. Getting to see more Shiketsu next week. Can't wait for that. One thumb up. Good chapter. One Piece 888, Lion. Really solid chapter. Loved everything to do with Moon Lion. Thought that was really cool. Carrot breaking off the helm was a really nice touch. The inclusion of her her flash stepping, basically, which is the thing we've seen Luffy do very often because of CP9, where he took that from them. They have a different name for it that I can't remember at the time, but Flash Step's what we know it from Bleach, so it's fine. Uh, I think it's really cool to see Big Mom getting weaker, and then, of course, now we're finally going to get back to Luffy versus Katakuri. Really good chapter. Next up, we have We Never Learn 43, Sometimes a Genius Travels Down Memory Lane with X. Really solid chapter. Absolutely loved everything about Yuiga's dad. The only thing that I think would have made it better is if we would focused a little bit more on Yuiga back in those days, instead of immediately converting back to a Takamoto chapter. It kind of just made it feel like we got a little bit of Yuiga in the middle. Takamoto's great. I don't dislike her at all, so I still really enjoyed this chapter. Definitely a thumb up. Looking forward to how calling her Uruka now is going to change things. Whew! Promise Land 67, The Forbidden Game Part 2. Really good chapter. Absolutely love everything to do with Luvis, uh, everything to do with Theo today, with Emma. All that was great. Absolutely love that chapter. Black Clover 137, Mary Leona, Mary Leona versus Raya the Disloyal. Really solid chapter. Seeing the living Sharingan come back is really cool. Uh, but And he got to do some really cool stuff. But I'm still really torn on how I feel about Mary Leona. Because I think she's really cool. But I think she's really OP. And I expect her to die or get really badly hurt soon. Dr. Stone 39, really solid surprise chapter. Didn't expect it, should have. Senku becoming uh, the chief. Seeing Genro go crazy with greed. Everything there. Really solid chapter. Looking forward to next chapter for sure. Robot Laser Beam 123, last day of the dies on open part 3. Really solid chapter. Robo's come out of his funk. He's ready to play. He's ready to give Dorian exactly what he thinks he needs to give him by beating him. And we'll see how that goes because he's down 4 right now. And I'm not really excited for how hard he's going to have to work to get there. But I hope he does it. Next up, Food Wars 243, first year kid. Great chapter. Absolutely loved all the symbolism. Absolutely loved learning from his previous faults and victories. Absolutely loved the Field of Blades, the fight with Saito specifically, and Saito admitting defeat, not losing. He did technically lose, but he admitted defeat because he viewed Soma's dish as better, which automatically makes it a better than just a regular loss. Really good chapter. One Punch Man 78 surrounded. Solid chapter. Uh, it felt like we were kind of aimless. We didn't stick with anybody for too long. But at the same time, there's a lot of setup that needs to be done for the Monster Association fight, so that makes perfect sense. Really solid chapter. Very much enjoyed it. Looking forward to next time, of course. And the special bonus manga, it was really good. Uh, it was really short, but I had a lot of fun with it, and I thought the gags were pretty good. Again, the, just the fact that I immediately had to stop and go, hold on a second, with the, uh, the Boruto cards, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And then finally, of course, next week, uh, Jump will be on break. So we won't have a weekly show and jump breakdown next week. But we'll be back Christmas week with another exciting episode of the weekly show and jump breakdown. My name is Trey. This has been the Full Spectrum. Remember to always enjoy the Full Spectrum. The jump has to off.